Last Saturday, Utah Republicans held their state nominating convention. The nearly 4,000 delegates had to pick candidates for governor, for the congressional delegation, and for Mitt Romney's open Senate seat, among others. Now, this is a presidential election year, and so these things are always wild and unruly. And I don't know if you've noticed, but the party is changing. So the more traditional players are jostling with the Donald Trump wing. And on Saturday, everyone expected a spectacle. And sure enough, they got one. Rather than settle much of anything, Governor Cox was forced into a primary race. There will be primary races for Romney's seat, for attorney general, for three of the four congressional seats. Spencer Stokes was at the convention on Saturday, and he says it all looked pretty familiar to him. Stokes is a longtime Republican Party player. He was executive director of the state party for a time. And this year, he says it made him think about the convention in 2010 when party delegates defeated the incumbent senator Bob Bennett and paved the way for Mike Lee. So we asked Stokes to set the stage for us. My fellow... It's on. My fellow Republicans, today the countdown is on. We are one. You had Tim Bridgewater, who had run a couple of other times, a scrappy businessman who was very articulate. He had a gravelly no voice, kind of like this. No more irresponsible spending. But he was no friendly. He rights. was engaging no with people. And you had Mike Lee. And I want to be your next U.S. senator. Who had been the general counsel for Governor Huntsman. Our federal government's too big. because And he was going around the state and talking about the Constitution. The power is in our hands. And he was getting great turnout. People were showing up, and they were listening to him, and they were delegates. And then you had Bob Bennett, who started out and for the longest time was the favorite senator for Utahns. Relationships are the real fruit of seniority, the kinds of contacts you can make. You had this very establishment guy, and the Tea Party movement was all about taking out the establishment guy. Politics is a team sport. We don't hear that in, the, in a campaign. It's when I'm elected, I will, and the world will change. And then you get Conventions are always carnival-like atmospheres. All of the booths were over the top. They had scaffolding over them and spotlights, and you've got people with T-shirts. You've got Mike Lee standing up on an elevated platform with a earpiece, microphone, sound system, speaking just as basically a preacher. The Constitution has been ignored by Congress for too long. And the Tea Party, their flag was the don't tread on me flag. And there were people in don't tread on me shirts and there were hats with don't tread on me it was very clear at that convention when you walked in and saw what the delegates were wearing you knew that bob bennett was in trouble so the rules were 60 40 a person comes out of the convention with 60 percent of the vote they become the nominee and once the first round of balloting happened, Bob Bennett was out. This is a guy who had been a power broker in Washington. He'd actually been in the room when negotiations were made on TARP and the auto bailout and as one of the advisors to Senator McConnell. He'd been in that room. And now... I can only imagine in his mind, he's thinking, I'm being thrown out by these people that don't know anything about what I've been through and what I've saved the country from. They're throwing me out. And the inevitable was he was not going to be a United States senator at the end of 2010. This guy was getting ousted in May. So he was going to go back to Washington, D.C. for seven months and have his colleagues look at him as a person who got defeated by this group of people in Utah wearing don't tread on me flags. 
and Mike Lee stayed in the race. I have loved being in the Senate. I have loved the association. I have enjoyed learning about the issues and being in the arena to try to solve them. I do not intend to leave the arena of public debate. That's what 2010 debate. was like. And I don't think that 2024 was really much different. It's been a long day for thousands of Republican delegates who came here to the state party convention, but you can see behind me, they are still going strong. You could tell when you went to caucus that it was going to be another year like 2010. Something big was going to happen at this convention. On Saturday, the doors opened at 7 a.m. for registration. And within a matter of an hour, the line to get registered had to have been at least a mile long. So you're in one large room with 4,000 seats and probably another 500, 600 people standing around the edge. What they didn't know was they were going to be hostages for the day. They started two hours late. The only food that I could see there was Spencer Cox was handing out pie pizza, which we know is delicious, and Phil Lyman was handing out Domino's pizza, not as delicious. But people were so hungry, they were willing to go up in their Phil Lyman shirt to the Spencer Cox booth and get a piece of pizza. But two bathrooms... I remember one time turning around and looking, and the men's bathroom line was as long as the women's bathroom line, which is, you know, rare. But you had everybody in this room from basically 1230 when they started to sometime between 1130 and midnight is when they ended. So I I have a speech prepared for you today. And uh, I think I'm going to turn off these monitors and, and uh, maybe just but maybe just say something different. Than when the I governor to took today. the stage, um, there had been some things that had gone on with a couple of big issues in the state. The transgender sports, transgender bathrooms. These were things that the governor wanted to take a more Utah way approach. And he wasn't taking the approach in these decision making policies of just burning the house down, which the delegates wanted somebody who was willing to burn the house down. And Governor Cox is not that person. And so that made a lot of people angry. I am so proud to be welcomed here today the same way you have welcomed lots of Republican governors over the years. Go- Governor Herbert got booed here and lost by 10 points, but won by 40 points in a Republican primary. And uh, Spencer Cox got up and, because he got booed, decided, I'm going to push back on these folks. Maybe, maybe you hate the 60 lawsuits that we filed against Pre- President Biden and this administration. Maybe you hate that we stopped DEI and, and ESG and CRT. Or maybe, maybe it's, maybe it's something much more simple. Maybe, maybe you just hate that I don't hate enough. Um, I, I am proud of my record. That only and revved I'm up this crowd even record more. I, take it to everyone in the state, all I will tell you that Spencer Cox is the first statewide candidate with the signature path, not to have also come out of the convention with enough votes to be a recognized party candidate. That's historic. It's never happened before. I'm a lifelong Republican. I've been the executive director of the Republican Party. I've never seen a more vitriolic or revved up crowd than I saw this year. Much like 2010, where you could tell another movement taking place. I got home at 12.30 on Saturday night, and, you know, I'm LDS, and I was really feeling like I wanted to call a mulligan on Sunday uh, (laughs) about going to church, especially since we have a 9 a.m. church. 
But, you know, my wife's a much better person than I am. So we got up and went to church and it was just nonstop member after member after member wanting to know what happened. I don't think that people in Utah want the national press to say that people were booed, that it was disorganized and went on until 1230. I mean, it doesn't seem like that's the Utah way. And so fellow Republicans on that Sunday said, I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed for us. Spencer Stokes. These days, he's a lobbyist. He also happens to be on KUER's advisory board. This is Radio West. I'm Doug Fabrizio. Today in the program, we're talking about the Republican Party convention on Saturday, what happened, how it compares to other political moments, and what it might tell us about the direction of the party. We have with us for the hour Sage Miller. She's KUER's politics and government reporter. Robert Gerke is the government and politics reporter for the Salt Lake Tribune. And we also have David Magleby with us. He's a professor emeritus of political science at Brigham Young University. Sage Miller got us started. Tensions were high. People were very amped. Hmm. And I also could witness, you know, some people very closed off, trying to make themselves small, trying not to make themselves noticed. Some lawmakers, I saw them throughout, you know, strewn out the Salt Palace Convention Center in downtown Salt Lake City, kind of just trying to stay behind the curtain, not trying to make a lot of notice for themselves. But people, I think, felt very emboldened. They were very vocal about who they liked and who they disliked. And that was on both sides, whether you were a Cox supporter or a Phil Lyman supporter. Mm -hmm. uh, Both crowds were pretty rowdy. And that's how I maybe I would just categorize how that convention went down. It was rowdy. It was long. And I think for a lot of people, it left a bad taste in their mouth. Yeah. Robert Gerke, what did you notice? Yeah, I mean, these conventions, my, the first convention I went to was in 2000, and that year they booed uh, Orrin Hatch, they booed Mike Levitt, they sent him both to a primary, <laughs> right. and and everybody was sort of shocked by that. And, and since then, it's been consistently, progressively getting more and more noisy, rowdy, raucous, vitriolic um and this year seemed to really uh hit the apex right i mean it was it was uh it was a raucous event and you know it wasn't surprising i don't think that governor cox got booed necessarily because we've seen it happen over and over we saw mitt romney get booed six years ago at convention we saw we saw cox get booed four years ago it it just it's 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 what happened the delegates are passionate about their political leanings and they're getting more and more and more conservative. David Magley, what do you think? I mean, is it this just just what happens at these things? Like n- nothing out of the ordinary or was this notable this year? Oh, I think it was notable in part because of the intensity. It was disrespectful, I guess is the word that I came away as I watched the clips. Uh, you've got a sitting governor uh, who is booed to the extent that he departs from his prepared text and gets into this, do you hate me because line, <laughs> right. which only further inflames the crowd. And then people shout out individual negative responses. So I, I think it has been a trend. This has been observed. Uh, and I think the fact that the convention has become so intensely ideological and so nasty was part of the reason why uh, Senate Bill 54 passed. Because I think elites in the state largely Republican elites, felt what happened in the Bennett experience in 2010 uh, should not be repeated. There needed to be an alternative way to the ballot. So uh, I think it was an appalling demonstration of disrespect. I want to come back to that state convention of 2010 when Bob Bennett was defeated. Um, Professor Magleby, say something about that. And I want to hear you all on this, although, Sage, I know you didn't weren't covering it in those days. Yeah. But how surprising was that moment? You, you, Professor Magleby, have described it as a turning point in 2010. Well, it was a turning point in that the incumbent didn't make it to the primary. Yeah. It was not a turning point because Republican incumbents had long been challenged hmm. by a starch conservative people. So Wallace Bennett, Senator Bob Bennett's father, had a primary in every one of his uh, re-elections. The conservative wing of the Republican Party in 68, for example, uh, could get 32, 33% of the delegates. 
and force a primary. Now, Wallace Bennett won those primaries. Bob Bennett would have won the primary in 2010. Warren Hatch did in 2012. Hmm. But what happened in 2010 was a couple of things. One, two candidates emerged that were strong challengers, Mike Lee and Bridgewater, and they activated that base to an extent in part because of outside money. A lot of outside money flew in at the organizational level from Club for Growth and Freedom Works, two very conservative interest groups. Remember, 2010 is the year of the Tea Party. Yeah. And so what those outside conservative groups wanted was a scout. And the best shot was Utah's process where they could bump him out at a convention. So they did. They spent a lot of money. They mobilized at the grassroots. And he came in third in the vote and therefore was not on the primary ballot. And that was a turning point in the sense that mainstream Republicans learned that to be able to get to the general election, they would have to have an alternative process, hence the petition process. Uh, Let me just underline the the petition process that you mentioned for those that may not understand, because um, I think it's important, this context. As a result of what happens in in 2010, party leaders, uh, moderates in the party, they create this option. This was a few years later in 2014 um, that – to keep something like that from happening to Bob Bennett, there becomes this signature option. Robert Gerke, would you explain what that is for yeah, people yeah. to understand? So, so Mike Levitt, Gail Miller, some other you know moderate Republican civic leaders got together and they were going to run a ballot initiative, the Count My Vote initiative it was called, to try to create this signature path to open up primaries so you didn't have to necessarily go through the hoops of going to convention. They cut a deal with the legislature and passed Senate Bill 54, which created this path to the ballot. You could gather, I believe, 2 percent of the signatures from registered voters in that in that respective district area that you're going to be running in. The, the whole idea was, well, we don't want Bob Bennett to happen every two years or every yeah. four years, right? They don't want to see people getting knocked out at conventions. So you know, the, now we have this avenue where – Governor Cox, for example, he finished. He didn't. He didn't win the convention right this this past week, but he's gathered signatures, so he advances to the primary. And the idea is, and I think there's there's merit to this, is that if you if you want to elect representatives, and and keep in mind, especially in a Republican state like this, these primaries are the the contests that matter, or the convention mattered at that point. Yeah. So if you want to have people who are elected who represent the constituents and re- look like the constituents and think like the constituents, then you need to have a more representative process. And that's the whole goal behind um, having these worked out in a primary where more people can p- participate rather than doing it at a convention where it's just a small handful, 4,000 delegates to get to decide everything. So the signature path has not been popular among many of the, in the Republican Party, especially the arch conservatives because they feel like it undermines their power. But it's held up. It was challenged in court. There have been efforts in the past to try to undo it, but it's held up so far. Why would you show up? If you knew <laughs> if you knew you were going to get booed and yelled at and you knew that you were more moderate than the really outspoken people in the audience, like why would you even go there? I mean, I think I think people do it. I, it Governor Cox, for example, I think I think you show up a so you don't look like you're afraid. Uh, mm-hmm. I think there is something to be said for you know standing in front of the you know the partisans who you know you represent and and speaking to them or you know and maybe there's some hope that you can connect with them on some level. Obviously, we saw that didn't happen, but I think the question you raise is a good one going forward because. Why would you do that? I mean, you don't need to do that. You don't need to put your family through that ordeal. And it's kind of meaningless now. We've seen in the past, we've seen Governor Herbert lose at convention and then win in the primary because of the signature gathering route. We've seen Mitt Romney lose at convention. We've seen John Curtis lose at convention. Now we've seen Spencer Cox lose at convention. You know, all of these people go through this process knowing that it doesn't mean anything at the end of the day. And going forward, especially given the tone and the direction it's headed, I, I think in the future it's it's going to become more and more irrelevant. They've made themselves irrelevant hmm. in many ways. 
I will also say I think it's a, a pretty large talking point within the Utah Republican Party in general. Like right now, the chair, Robert Axon, knew that people were very much so displeased with how the fun- how, with how convention rolled out, specifically for the fact that it went like 17 hours. Yeah. Um, started at 7, and I'm pretty sure they – 7 a.m., and I'm pretty sure it adjour- adjourned at 11.56 yeah. p.m. Yeah. And it was because they had a hard out of the Salt Palace at 11.59 p.m. So everything needed to be done, right? And they still didn't get – to all the business that they needed to. But even during when people were complaining, when you know people's eyes were starting to, you know, really way heavy because they've just been listening to people talk for hours. He said, people say this is an archaic system, that we shouldn't do this any, anymore, but we know that it's important to our party in a way to have voices heard and part of like the democratic process. So the party is sticking with it. And at some point, too, even if the delegates don't represent uh, the voters that you are vying for, it is still a foundation that the party is advocating for. So you show up because it's still part of your party platform, huh. even if you know that isn't going to be the way that you win votes votes. And I have heard kind of chatter, fundamental, strong people within the Republican Party in Utah who are like, something needs to change. We can't do this anymore. I've heard staunch supporters of the convention system say, I think this is our last one. I don't know how it survives from here. Well, and if I could, there is a case to be made for the conventions. And David could probably speak to this as well. But, uh, you know, you have the the beauty of it is is you have these small neighborhood meetings where you choose your delegates and you talk about the issues and then they go vet the candidates and the candidates have to talk to those people those delegates are very powerful people or, or were more powerful before the signature gathering route obviously but and and you don't need to be if you're a candidate you don't need a lot of money to go through the convention process right that's the big criticism of the signature path is it costs yep. a quarter million dollars to gather all the signatures you need to run statewide so it's more democratic it, it, it's more it's more yeah a small D Democratic. Yeah. And, and so there is some merit to that, I think. And it, I think it is kind of sad, frankly, that you have to have so much money to get on the ballot now. But, you know, they, it's sort of a product of the of the times and a product of the process that we've taken this alternative route. And I will say that was one of the big concerns that I heard from people who are, you know, gung ho all in on the caucus convention system is that it did allow people who didn't have buckets and bags of money raking in campaign donations in order to get on the ballot. It's they, they said it felt more grassroots. It felt more um, citizen driven. It felt more representative of the everyday voters who, you know, don't have a bunch of money sitting in their bank account, but still have a larger. Like, it, it gave them kind of maybe the comfort that the people who are winning convention aren't the people with the most amount of money. The, the downside, however, is that the, the delegates tend to be older, whiter, more male, more stridently partisan, both the Democratic can, uh, delegates and the Republican ones. And so you you don't necessarily get a truly representative pool of delegates, yeah. which gives you candidates who also aren't necessarily representative of the people they're, just, they're supposed to be representing. David Magley, what do you think is the future of this caucus convention system? Can it is it sustainable? Well, it, it's going to be decided by the legislature or by ballot initiative because the legislature likes it. It works for them huh. and works for them ideologically. But back to Robert's point, these are not representative of the Republican Party. What they're representative of is people who are willing to show up on a single night at a single hour, endure a long, long meeting, and cast a ballot. That is relatively small in terms of numbers of people. And it's not at all like a primary election where you can vote by mail, where you can vote early, you can vote over a wide range of hours. So the data, I think, in Utah and in Iowa, the state closest to Utah hmm. in process is this system leads to extremism. And, and one more point, I, if, if I could, about the irrelevance of this of these conventions. You know, we saw Phil Lyman get 66 percent of the uh, delegate vote. Yeah. Uh, there was a poll that came out this week of Republican voters that said that Spencer Cox has 81 percent support. Yeah. So it, it shows, to David's point, that this is not a representative pool. Robert Gerke, he's the government and politics reporter at the Salt Lake Tribune. We also have with us Sage Miller. She's KUER's political and government reporter, also co-host of the podcast State Street. David Magleby is a professor emeritus of political science at Brigham Young University.
Uh, David Magleby, you told us something this week that uh, that was really interesting. I wanted to ask you about. You, you say that what had happened on Saturday at the convention was reminiscent of what was happening in the country's south in the '30s and the '40s and '50s and '60s. Will you take us through that? Explain what you mean. Sure. And so part of why this is happening in Utah is we're a one-party state. Yeah. And therefore, as as Robert mentioned, the stakes are very high. Uh, this is tantamount to election. And so what happens when you have a dominant party, the Democratic Party in the South, during what was called the South, call it South era, and the Republican Party in Utah now, and a few other states around the country, is you develop within the dominant party factions. They can be driven by two major forces, ideology, where the factions differentiate themselves based upon disputes over some set of policies, but they're still within the broad array of conservative. It's just, I'm more conservative than you are, yeah. or you're not as conservative as I am because of this. And I think we see that in the Republican Party. So Spencer Cox, by any national indication, would be seen as a conservative governor, clearly a Republican governor, and well-esteemed by other Republican governors. But within Utah, there's a faction that doesn't think he's pure enough. And therefore, they are defining themselves as the anti-Cox faction. So that's the ideological dimension of the Solid South and Utah now today. The second dimension is they are developed cults of personality within the dominant party. And candidates kind of line up behind them or seek to be associated with them in ways that advance their uh, chances. Now, candidates have long endorsed other candidates an endorsement from Gary Herbert uh, to Republican voters, and perhaps some Democrats and independents as well, would carry some sway, for example. But within the single-party system, these camps become entrenched. And what I was fascinated by, and I'd appreciate Robert and Sage's observations firsthand on this, is the involvement of Donald Trump in his endorsement of Mr. Staggs. Yeah. And a surprise for me, the endorsement of Mike Lee for Mr. Jenkins, both of which prevailed at the convention, it signaled to me that this cult of personality surrounding Trump, which was predictable, but now surrounding Lee, does that create within Utah sort of the Lee club for candidates to want to cozy up to him when they get elected to the House or even to the state legislature? So I think Utah is now a solidly Republican state with these dynamics. Do you mean that Mike Lee is now sort of stepped into the kingmaker role in some way? Yes. Hmm. And traditionally at state party levels, it's the governor yeah. and or the senior senator, but typically the governor, especially in the year when the governor is running. Well, let's Sage. Let, let, let me just mention it. So, so it's a Riverton Mayor Trent Staggs yeah. running for Senate. Of course, Mitt Romney is not. Um, and as as uh, Professor Magleby mentioned, uh, Donald Trump makes this endorsement. We'll talk about the Mike Lee endorsement of Colby Jenkins here in a moment. But what, what do you what do you make of all of that? What I experienced walking in to or even like before the convention happened when it was around Trent Staggs, like he has been kind of the MAGA candidate from the get go. And that was one of his talking points when he was on the stage, even. Um, I mean, it was after the Trump endorsement came for him, but he's always just kind of been on the Trump train. We had what he came, Matt Gates, who was also part of the Freedom Caucus in the U.S. House, who is also a big Trump fan, uh, come out and endorse him. So he was already kind of the preferred candidate that would stay aligned with Trump. And so I think a kind lot of MAGA candidate. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. was a MAGA. He is the MAGA candidate. Right. And so walking into convention and the delegates who are also, you know, a big fan of Trump, they were most likely going to vote for Stags anyway. I think that the Trump endorsement just gave them it affirmed their decision to want to vote for Staggs. And you heard him bring up the Trump endorsement a handful of times while he was on the candidate stage uh, for delegates. And they all cheered for him. And there's a lot of people, you know, wearing MAGA hats, uh, Make America Great Again uh, hats. So I think that he was going to be safe regardless. But I do think that it did give him a little bit of a boost. It didn't hurt him. What do you think, Robert? I'm thinking back to 2012 when Mitt Romney was running for president. He was the golden child, right? Yeah. In 2016, when Trump was the nominee, Mike Lee was 
adamantly opposed to him. And I remember being in Cleveland when Mike Lee was trying to pull out all the stops, this last ditch effort to try to keep Donald Trump from being the nominee. And he had said that Donald Trump was an embarrassment to the party and should resign and, you know, remove himself as a candidate. Now we're in 2024 and Mike Lee and Donald Trump are the kingmakers of the power brokers of the Republican Party. I think the endorsement was a huge get for Trent Staggs. And I think for Colby Jenkins, it, it, it elevated his candidacy from, you know, and also ran to the winning candidate in that district. So and and it's he says he's going to keep doing it. Mike Lee does. He's going to keep endorsing people. I don't know that it necessarily has quite the same gravitas as outs- Trump as Trump and and outside of the delegate pool when you're talking more about a larger, you know, electorate. But Mike Lee's still very popular with that. He's mm-hmm. he's clearly the most popular uh, Republican in the party. You know, and and could you imagine if Mitt Romney had shown his face at this convention Saturday? It would, there would have been a bloodbath. It just shows how far this party has moved, I think. And so, yeah, uh, going forward, it, it is Donald Trump's Republican Party now. We used to be sort of a moderate Utah Way Chamber of Commerce, Gary Herbert party, but it's it's moved radically to the right, and it's it's now the party of Donald Trump and Mike Lee. Well, and it made a difference, I think, in a couple of ways. One is Jenkins got 57% of the delegates on the final vote, only 3% short of what he needed to not have a primary. And the incumbent, albeit a short-term incumbent, yeah, Malloy, Malloy. Uh, is much below. And, and the kingmaker element struck me as interesting because there was a dispute between Lee and Malloy over the FISA extension, the requirement to get clearance before doing national security wiretaps of of non-Americans. And Malloy didn't vote Lee's way on that. She voted to extend FISA. And Lee was very mad about that. Uh, So what this says is, if this goes forward, does a senator like Lee have sway over a House member because he may endorse an opponent, as Lee did with Mm -hmm. Jenkins? And it was an unprecedented move. I don't think a lot of incumbents from a different chamber come out and uh, and endorse a candidate that is not the incumbent. So right. already off the that, that made it one of the most interesting races to watch at the convention yeah. was the Lee endorsement. And what then I also saw this was kind of like almost a fraction or infighting within the Republican Party itself because you had Mike Lee and he didn't make any comments with Colby Jenkins. He just stood on stage with him hmm. and um you know like waved and said hello like I have the like I am giving this man the endorsement. Um, um, and Colby Jenkins kind of ran with it. And that did work. It almost worked out for him. He didn't run away with the nomination. They're going to a primary because yeah. he did not get 60 percent, which means Malloy and Jenkins are headed to a primary on June 25th. And so what we also saw, though, is Malloy bring out Representative Burgess Owens, who is also popular amongst delegates to say, hey, I support my colleague. I'm standing behind her and y'all should vote for her. And that seemed to have some sway because people don't like the delegates don't really have any contention or beef with Burgess Owens. And what Malloy also did there, though, is it has had some interesting rhetoric, essentially, where she said, I'm not going to back down or bow down to anybody, including a senator, wow. essentially calling out Mike Lee for going Going behind her back and uh, endorsing Jenkins. And that got a lot of roars from the crowd, her saying she's not going to back down, she's not going to bow down. She's also the only female candidate advancing for a federal race. And so I do think that some people are reading into that as well as like, what does this mean? Mike Lee, though, he did have a power. He had some yield over Jenkins winning, but he also endorsed Derek Brown, who was running for Utah Attorney General. Yeah. He lost hard. I think he walked away with about 16% of the vote and thank goodness he gathered signatures or you would not see his name on the ballot. Mike Lee's endorsement did not matter in that race whatsoever. So we're not sure he's a kingmaker in all of these races. And, and all. Not in all of these races, but you know, the the non-Lee endorsed candidates for AG are also headed to a primary. So now there's going to be three Republican AG candidates to choose from come June 25th. Well, and the question becomes... What difference will it make in the general election? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And will Trump play an active role in this U.S. Senate election? He has in other states, Pennsylvania, Ohio, in prior cycles. He, he has every indication he will again. Will that With mixed uh, results, we should say, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, will he continue to support stags against John Curtis and others, a sitting House member in a primary? And, and how will Utah voters voters in a primary yeah. sort through that. The same with Lee and Jenkins. 
uh, in that race with Malloy. I want to um, – can I just ask a little bit about Mitt Romney and his <laughs> – he wasn't actually physically present there. I, why would he be, I guess? Um, but would Mitt Romney have made it out of – well, that 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 convention um, would he be elected in a primary? I mean, clearly he would have been, you know, sent to a primary. Could he have? Um, would he have continued success if had he wanted to run? Like, what is the atmosphere? Would it have been like for? I know this is all speculation, but what do you think? He would have lost a convention, gather signatures, go to a primary. You know, then he's got a fighting chance still. I think, but you know, he's not the torchbearer for the party anymore, like he was with the Utah Republicans coming out of the Olympics and running for president. And he was the favorite son. And and now he's persona non grata. He knows that. You know, when he announced he wasn't going to run again, he said he thinks that if he did run, he could win. But I think, you know, he saw the writing on the wall. It was going to be a a really hard race. And the outcome was probably very much in doubt. I think the parties left him. And uh, I don't see any way that he could have you know, had a snowball's chance of emerging from that convention. I think the party's left him for now. I it's like it's something that I'm trying to grapple with is what does it look like four years from now? What are both parties going to do? Wait, so what you're saying then is that you think there's going to be some kind of realignment yeah. after the dust settles of 2024? Yeah, after huh. whoever wins the presidency, both part, and then there's the next presidential election. Both parties are in the midst of an identity crisis that look different, but they have to figure out what's next because neither of them really have a candidate. <laughs> you know, they're like they're putting all their chips on the table of Trump and Biden and uh, trying to get the party aligned. But we always see these shifts when we have a new successor popping into office. Um, and I, I don't really know what that looks like. We see that especially in Utah, Utahns, Republican voters, there are – you know, strong fan bases. There are the Trump fanatics and those people who will only show up for the primary and kind of hold their breath and swallow and figure out what happens next. Um, and I don't I don't I, I think that's going to be really interesting for the Utah Republican Party about where they go from here. Well, I think that's a good question. I wanted to hear Robert Gurkey. I wanted to hear you on that. And, and David Magaby, Professor Magaby, let me ask you, do you think that that this MAGA wave is going to subside, that the the party is not going to be marked by this moment, that things will realign over time. It, that does seem to happen. Do you think that's the trajectory here? I think it could happen if Trump loses. Huh. I think if Trump wins, it'll reinforce this. Yeah. Um, hmm. But I want to go back, if I could, Doug, and go out on a limb here. I think Romney could win a primary in Utah. Uh, yeah. But I think there are forces that will make would have made it even harder for him in terms of closed primary rules that the legislature has adopted and strengthened. I think there are plenty of Democrats in Utah who would have voted for, for for Romney in the Republican primary. They would have changed their registration to become a Republican, either because they were Democrats or they were unaffiliated. So I, I think when we talk about the Republican Party, we have to differentiate hmm. between this group that gets elected at mass meetings, and the state legislature, by the way, that get elected in largely gerrymandered legislative districts. So they're secure. The thing they're worried about is not a competition from the Democrats. It's getting primaried by somebody even more conservative than them, Mr. Mr. Lyman, for example. Mm-hmm. And so what we've got is a rigid Republican Party without competition that permits them to move further and further to the right. What Romney would do if he had run this time, I think, is force the very realignment that Sage was just talking about, Hmm. because I think a lot of people prefer his more moderate approach to the more stridently Trump approach. And the test for that would have been the 2024 primary with Romney running. David Magleby, he's a professor emeritus of political science at Brigham Young University, We also have with us Sage Miller, KUER's politics and government reporter, also co-host of the podcast State Street, and Robert Gerke. He's the government and politics reporter at the Salt Lake Tribune. Right now, when you get to a primary and you have a moderate candidate running against a more kind of, I don't know, put it this way, radical candidate, I suppose. 
who will win? Because so far, the way it's always worked is the moderate has prevailed and pretty easily. We're going to find out a lot this coming primary election. I think there's one um, one race that I'm specifically thinking of. It's in Davis County. Trevor Lee, who is the he won the the, the Davis County GOP county convention against Daniela Harding, and she did not win <laughs> that that convention. She did not win that convention, but she did gather signatures, and she is considered a more moderate candidate. And Trevor Lee is considered a more firebrand MAGA. He's younger as well. He really kind of mobilizes the more ultra conservative voters, and that's kind of his platform. And I wonder how that will look like if Daniela Harding does win against Trevor Lee. I think that's a good indicator of maybe well, where but, the party is heading. Why, but why not? What, what, what Phil Lyman wins over Spencer Cox? That seems incredibly unlikely. Yeah. But um, you know, but, but there are any a list of these? Yeah, I think I think the one that is going to be maybe the best barometer we have of where the party is is the John Curtis Senate race because he is. Mm-hmm. Sort of a cut from the Mitt Romney cloth of sort of a chamber of commerce moderate, you know, small government low tax. So, so the setup here is Curtis is and Staggs. The, the field. I mean, yeah. you've got Staggs, you've got Brad Wilson, you've got right. uh, Walton. Okay. Um, and so it's it that muddies it up a little bit. But I think that I think that John Curtis one is going to be kind of a, mm-hmm. a, a you know take the temperature of where this party is. And and so if Curtis wins, it gives you a sense that for now the state the, may stay in that moderate the, phase. The center mm-hmm. the center can hold, I guess as you could say. <laughs> yeah. um, as far as the future of the party goes, too. I mean, I. I I, there's, I think there is this whole sort of next generation of people mm-hmm. who have come up in the in the Trump world, right? Mm-hmm. That next generation of candidates is climbing the ladder based on their Trump bona fides, right? right? right. So, I think whether Trump wins or loses, it, it will have a bearing. But I also think that the, the, this whole movement is going to spawn a whole next generation of of. Trump loyalists that are going to take take over. They're, they're going to be the next ones running for these offices. And so mm-hmm. I would think that the party can, will continue to move in that direction unless it starts to tear itself apart and unless this fissure gets so bad that, you know, it can't keep itself together anymore. Two things on that. The first one, when I brought up the Trevor Lee versus Daniela Harding race, I think that we've talked a lot about federal races, but the state legislature will always impact the Utah more than what happens on the federal level in most cases. So looking at how the state legislature is shifting is important. Additionally, gerrymandering does play a huge role in this, and that's the world that we live in right now. So that's the lens I'm looking it through. And you look at these more kind of purple areas in Salt Lake County, where the Republicans do have to have a really interesting calculus. If they go too far to the right, they are going to lose the independent voters in those areas of West Valley, of Magna, of Taylorsville. And so they can't go 100% with the base all the time, or they're going to annihilate voters and Democrats are going to win those seats in some areas. Where the Utah Republican Party is heading is more interesting to me than the national scope of it, because there's so many different fractions. And even at convention, I think it was uh, it was, it was CD two, CD3, who, which one is Con- Curtis? He's CD3, right? Three. three. Yeah. So in CD3, it and was... CD, you mean congressional? Yeah. In the congressional district, district three, um, which is John Curtis's old district, kind of covers Southern Utah a lot. Representative uh, Senator Mike Kennedy, state Senator Mike Kennedy is running for that seat. He was going convention route only against Zach Wilson, who was a 29-year-old Republican. And when he was on the convention stage, he made a pretty convincing argument to a handful of people. Um, he didn't end up winning. (laughs) But to a handful of people was the Republican base is losing young voters. They are not resonating with them. And I'm a 29 year old who can actually have representation in Washington to show that the party is younger to kind of break this stereotype of what it means to be a Republican. I think one interesting thing to consider, too, is, you know, we're talking about the future of the Republican Party. But when we put that in context of the future of this, the political climate in this state, I mean, if we look back to the Mike Lee, Evan McMullen race, right? You know, Mike Lee won that race by 10 points. He won at 53-43. But that was the closest Senate election we've had since 1976. So I think if the party keeps moving in that direction, I think it creates a wider avenue, a wider lane for a moderate to actually win a race in this state, which uh, would be, you know, would be, I think, a wake up call to the party leadership that, oh, boy, you know, maybe we've gone too far and they'd have to correct course a little bit. Well, let me ask, uh, I guess, finally, one of the things Governor Cox told the crowd that was 
booing him and yelling at him um, on Saturday was that he was proud of his record and that he was going to take it, as he put it, to all 900,000 Utah Republicans in our primary who will vote. Like, I guess what he was saying was, here you are a handful of extremists. When I take it to rank and file Republicans, I am going to prevail. And I guess we sort of dealt with that question to some degree, but is, is, is that right? And I guess finally, what are you all looking for? What are you going to be paying attention to now? Um, Sage, what do you think? I think I'm going to be paying attention to if the incumbents win and if any of the convention candidates win. I'm curious to see if any convention candidates win the primary because a lot of them are going to primaries. Like this is going to be a pretty stacked primary yeah. season. There's a lot of races to cover. That's mostly kind of what I'm looking for. A lot of um, campaign rhetoric as well. What are people hitting the pavement on? And with Cox too, it's like what I find interesting with him is that he is essentially backed down and signed every single policy these delegates have wanted and they still don't like him. So it's like what would Phil Lyman do differently? And I guess like this is going back a little bit because he was eliminated the first round of voting. But what would Carson Jorgensen do? Like what? Like what's the difference between Phil Lyman and Carson Jorgensen? Like why do you like Phil Lyman more? I think it's just it's going to be a lot. It's going to be really. really <laughs> Robert Gerke, what about you? What are you looking for? Yeah, I mean, I think I mentioned the John Curtis race. I think that one is a, again take a good barometer for where the party is and where it's going. Yeah. Um, looking ahead to your point. Whether these convention candidates win or lose, I think, is going to be telling because if Spencer Cox crushes Phil Lyman like we anticipate he will, if John Curtis wins that Senate seat, if Derek Brown wins the attorney general's race, which is – you know, he's got a good chance there. Um, Malloy keeps her seat. If, if Malloy keeps her seat, then you've got to ask yourself, why the heck do we keep doing this stupid convention thing? Hmm. Because A, it's not representative. B, it's not producing anything. It's a waste of time. And I think you you start, you might start seeing, given the tone of this most recent convention, you might start seeing talk of lowering the signature thresholds, making that an even more appealing route for people to take. Um, because I think that, you know, when you see – the, the moderates like Spencer Cox getting booed and heckled and and you know harassed. I think that sends a real chill up the spine of some of the state party leaders, state legislators, and I think you I think there could be changes in the works. Final word from uh, you, Professor David Magleby. I agree with what Robert just said uh, that I think if the signature candidates prevail, it's going to reinforce what we've been talking about. I also think that people like Curtis and Cox uh, are going to come out of this uh, energized with other communities besides these delegates, especially funders. Hmm. I think a lot of Republicans who are moderate mainstream Republicans are going to say, I'm upset with what happened at this convention. Here's a check. You got to defeat these people. And so I'm, I'm not so sure that it's a negative for them as they go into the general. It may well pay a dividend uh, for them. The other thing is, I think there's some independence that candidates like Moore and Curtis have, uh, if they can prevail, in their votes on things like Ukraine. They were the two Utah yeah. House members who voted to fund Ukraine. The other two didn't. And, of course, I mentioned the Malloy vote that got uh, Senator Lee mad. So I, th I think if they can prevail with the primary electorate, it makes them more able to go their own way in the House. And a final thought, the real cure to this is party competition. If there are viable Democratic candidates who could step in, should some of these convention candidates get nominated and defeat them, actually, in a general election? So assume Brown doesn't get the nomination. That attorney general seat is, is uh, low-hanging fruit for a Democrat. Uh, we haven't had a Democratic AG in a long time after repeated scandal. David Magleby. He's a professor emeritus of political science at Brigham Young University. We also had with us Sage Miller, KUER's politics and government reporter. She also co-hosts the podcast State Street. And Robert Gerke is the government and politics reporter at the Salt Lake Tribune. Radio West is a production of KUER. You can subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. The program is produced by Benjamin Bombard and Tim Slover. Kerry Watson is our executive producer. I'm Doug Fabrizio. Oh.